Hare Krishna. Uh, we'll get started, I guess. Could someone confirm on the chat if I'm audible? Yes, Prabhuji, you're audible. No, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणी निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश चारिणी चैप्टर briefly uh last time we had done seven so we are continuing with eight this time uh um, i don't have a very elaborate ppt but uh, just put up some points that we would be discussing right just request everyone to be muted i okay so in the eighth chapter uh, we are going to look at some themes today so i have listed up uh, some topics of discussion uh, the first uh, theme that we are taking is importance of specific non translatable words so basically uh, if you see this eighth chapter it begins with arjuna asking definitions of certain terms right that's how it begins अर्जुन वाच किम तद ब्रह्म किम अध्यात्म किम कर्म पुरुषोत्तम आदिभूतम से किम प्रोक्तम आदिदेव किम उच्यते आदि यज्ञम कथम कोत्र देहेस्मिन मधुसूदन प्रयाण काले च कथम नेयोसी नित्यतात्म बिहि सो बेसिकली अर्जुन इज सेइंग दैट आस्किंग ओ लॉर्ड व्हाट इज ब्रह्मन व्हाट इज अध्यात्म व्हाट इज कर्म व्हाट इज आदिभूतम व्हाट इज आदिदेव ही इज आस्किंग definitions of terms and that is how this eight chapter begins and of course uh, he is asking about eight questions and the final question he is asking is prayana kale ch katam how can those engaged in um, devotional service at the time of death know you at the time of death so he is asking about the time of death right so in the first three four verses of the eighth chapter krishna is defining these terms so we wish to begin our discussion today uh, with this particular concept of the importance of non translatable words so if you see there are these six um, vedangas which are like shiksha chandas vyakaran nirukta kalpa jyotisha so on the slide if you see i have put up the brief purposes of each right so shiksha the purpose of shiksha is Uh, so so there are three things so so everything is all these are related to the vedas correct so there are three headings if you see on the slide one is to preserve the words in the vedas okay so how are the words in the vedas preserved they are preserved using these two bodies of knowledge one is shiksha which is to learn the generation and pronunciation of letters okay so you preserve the words in the vedas by first understanding how to pronounce everything where it generates correct so uh, we have all these things which generates from uh, uh, using the lips using the palate and uh, so on right so that is called shiksha the right pronunciation because we know because the the point is that in the vedic system these words have to be chanted perfectly 
yes krishna is bhavagrahi but that doesn't mean that we intentionally not even try to chant things properly so even for example we are chanting the hare krishna mahamantra we have to chant properly right we have to chant hare krishna it has to be clear we cannot i mean there are several wrong pronunciations uh, of these words correct so ram so it has to be like that only hare ram hare ram 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 hare hare it cannot be for example hare ram hare ram okay so the the point is okay somebody may say okay even if i chant like that i am getting benefit that is krishna's prerogative krishna is considered so he is giving us benefit but shiksha lays first emphasis on the pronunciation of the letters how you should say, so one could one cannot say hare lam hare lam 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 hare hare say that no r has to be pronounced okay so these the shabda itself has the potency it it's not just the meaning correct like for example we say krishna is all attractive that doesn't mean that i can simply chant uh, hey all attractive all attractive hare all attract i can't come up with a different mantra right so then that's not the mantra at all so i can't i can't substitute that word krishna krishna may mean all attractive but uh, the benefit of chanting krishna is different and simply if you chant all attractive that is different that, that is not chanting krishna okay similarly rama is a supreme enjoyer so i i cannot simply say that i will chant jay supreme enjoyer jay supreme enjoyer no i have to chant rama only okay so so that is my shiksha you have to know from where these words are generated and how to pronounce it and this applies to all the vedas okay so shiksha preserves the words in the vedas the second thing that preserves the words in the vedas is chandah chandah means to grasp the count and letters nature of letters in a verse like uh, we all know right that uh, different verses are in different chandas chandas can be roughly translated as meter also anushtup chanda and there are these various chandas <laughs> so unless you know the chandas you cannot actually uh, repeat a particular statement correctly right so sometimes we see that we may see some verse which is not in the chandas that we know so many of us may not even know how to chant it we may just read it as prose or something but someone who knows various chandas will be able to chant even a big uh, shloka or verse nicely so the point is shiksha and chanda chandas these are used to preserve the words in the vedas because without this that cannot be done so the goal is protection of the vedas correct so similarly to safeguard the meaning of the vedas which is the second broad item we have vyakaran ne nirukta Yeah, so vyakaran is going to identify the components of the word and give meanings to it so unless that is done properly the meanings of the vedas can be twisted by somebody right like these british indologists they did lot of mischief with the words of the vedas by giving uh, various uh, concocted meanings or uh, deliberately mischievous meanings to distort the entire shloka or the prose that is being stated so vyakaran purpose is for that okay. to identify components in it and nirukta is to learn the meaning of complex words in the veda so there can be a very complex word okay so nirukta is a dictionary literally speaking but again it's not exactly a dictionary so that's why you know we are calling it non translatable words because these words are not translatable so nirukta is um, the, the purpose of nirukta is to learn the meaning of these complex words from the vedas okay so how these words could be given the right kind of meaning so so that is nirukta so so one is for the components of the word and one is to give meaning to the word itself and similarly to protect the performance of vedic deeds okay so there are yagya there are puja and so on right there are these two things kalpa and jyotisha kalpa is to master the procedure that means how do you do a yagya how do you build the vedi the altar how do you do everything hmm? that's the first thing or how do you do a particular puja or whatever and jyotisha to ascertain the time to perform vedic deed i mean anything vedic deed here uh, could mean even uh, something like garbhadan sanskar that is also a deed only vedic deed right to invoke a child in the family so traditionally people would see uh, panchanga the right time to conceive hmm? 
because there are auspicious times in auspicious times so the whole purpose of jyotish was actually nowadays you know when we say jyotisha and astrology we mainly use it in order to understand or try to understand our own difficulties which is fine which is that is actually a secondary purpose of jyotisha if you see the jyotish shastra the main purpose is to understand when a yagya can be done so for example it is said that when kings in the previous times would start one elaborate yagya they would consult jyotisha for example to come to know whether they will be alive for that entire period because sometimes that yagya may be for a period of one year right we sometimes read multi year sacrifices in the vedas in puranic stories so kings were they, there was a need for a king to understand whether he would live that long in order to do that yagya if he is undertaking let us say a two year yagya and he should not have any health problem right in the middle of the yagya otherwise he will be nowhere he will not be unable to fulfill it so for so so jyotisha was used for for that purpose when to perform not only in terms of the deed but in terms of the performer also whether it is the right time for him to perform this particular deed i hope you are able to understand there are two things here one is the deed and one is the performer of the deed okay so in marriage also it is done because that's also vedic uh, deed or whatever so to find out the right muhurta to do things but if you see these six shastras which are there shiksha chandas vyakaran nirukta kalpa jyotisha ultimately they are all related to protecting the vedas either the words of the vedas the meaning of the vedas or the performance of vedic deeds okay so why we are starting with this is because even uh, you know words they so now here we are talking in terms of nirukta because in this eighth chapter arjuna is asking the meaning of specific word correct so because unless those uh, words are properly understood you can uh, make a mess of things mm? that's why for example we we see that shila prabhupada would always say dharma is not religion because people would perhaps say that uh, you know uh, people would call dharma as religion but then that is not the meaning right dharma is dharma is a completely uh, different uh, very much more elaborate uh meaning in that there are so many uh, um, there is a very elaborate description of how dharma could be defined so so the point is unless you understand the word itself you wouldn't understand the meaning mm. so so for some word we see sir prabhupad would come up with a particular type of meaning mm. like for example we see prabhupad translated karma as fruitive activity in one sense it was his own you know innovation on that particular thing which is quite apt as in fruit of activities indicates whatever a person is doing in this world uh, for his papa punya etc but still the point is english as a language has limitations so the same effect which is there in a sanskrit word never comes up in the english word and sometimes there is so for example if you see uh, devotional uh, the, like you see rasa rasa shastra right rasa we say bhakti rasa amrit sindhu So it was Bhagwan Sri Ramdas Saraswati who translated "rasa" as "mellow." It's a very it, it, "mellow" is an English word. Perhaps that is very equal to and tries to convey that word. But still, the word "rasa" itself it, it has its own charm, as in it 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 would have a much more sense of completeness. Okay. So so this is also important, especially when we talk to people in general. Like for example, if you see the word "devata." in sanskrit we all know that propa translated that particular word as demigod correct he used demigod for that particular word devata because that that's what the foreigners would understand the, the british the westerners who with where he started you know talking about the krishna conscious philosophy but again if you see this particular word demigod if if you see the meaning even if you just open a wikipedia or on google you try to understand the meaning of the word Uh, demigod it has a very strict roman Christ, uh, this pagan connotation so the, in in this roman empire before christianity they had all these pagan gods who were a product of a, a god and a human 
like for example like yudhishthir maharaj right he was born from kunti and dharma raj that means one parent is someone divine and one parent is human such people are actually called demigods in the roman uh, system of uh, you know pagan gods or whatever they had okay i mean the the, the deities they had prior to christianity etc so why i am saying this is because when we use the word demigod especially uh, for example if you use the word demigod and the westerner is hearing he will come up with his own understanding of what this means whereas in our context when we say lord shiva or lord brahma they are not exactly that they are not a combination of a, a human and a, and a, some deity you know so it's not like that so so something different over here so so the idea is at, at least with indians as far as possible if we could use that sanskrit term itself especially because nowadays increasingly more and more sanskrit terms are acceptable in english vocabulary in any case like yoga has become acceptable guru has become acceptable no yoga also if you translate it it's extremely difficult because can you imagine yoga means to unite but then again it has such a broad understanding the word yoga in the bhagavad gita it becomes very difficult to limit it to just one or two english words okay even phrases from english language when we use like i was very surprised when i uh, discovered this that this english phrases they right as you sow so shall you reap we use this in the context of karma many times saying that as you sow so shall you reap but interestingly in the christian thought they came up with this phrase to say that as you sow so shall you reap means if you are a good christian and at the time of death when you are buried as you sow you know you you put the person in coffin and you bury him so shall you reap on the day of judgment he is awakened and taken back to the heavens or whatever so it's very surprising uh, something we use in the context of karma but uh, the origin of that phrase is something different totally i mean they had come up with their own so there is a theology there is a there is an idea behind that particular phrase so this indicates the challenge of converting something from one language to another so coming back to this particular so there are so many words like that if you carefully see you know there are so many words in the, our uh, scriptures etc where it is very difficult to uh, to come up with some exact uh, Uh, english equivalent extremely difficult because sometimes english language wouldn't even have the necessary uh, words the necessary ways of expressing those sanskrit terms it, it could not even have like jati we translate it as caste we translate as i said earlier dharma as religion we do all these things right we translate atma as soul we we translate brahman as god many times now that's again a very interesting translation so for example this is why this is this was a problem with some impersonalist uh, philosophers from india who went to america because i- i- in sanskrit you say aham brahmasmi but then in english when you say i am god it has a completely different meaning actually so aham brahmasmi is fine but i am god is totally wrong it's, it's completely off track because brahman is not is not exactly god in that sense right brahman can refer to the atma in certain context brahman could refer to the impersonal brahman even param brahman is called as brahman only so if you see these words they come with their own uh, charm in sanskrit but when you make it in english so that's why i gave this example uh, some impersonalist who who is used to saying aham brahmasmi he translates it as i am god and then it has a completely different understanding i mean people will say are how, how this is then uh, we, we 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 give various names to these people oh they are rascals and this and that right because they are saying that they are god and so on but actually what he wanted to perhaps say was i am brahmasmi but in english language he couldn't convey that properly so we ended up saying i am god okay so so why we are discussing this is because in this particular chapter krishna arjuna is opening up by asking specific definitions of words correct Uh, what is adi bhutam adi devam so adi devam is translated as devata here by the way right adi devam because krishna is saying that adi devam uh, is referring to the uh, devatas hmm? 
correct yeah all the devatas are being referred to okay so it, it's it's very challenging to translate these words exactly in english so that's why also when we read that's why uh, when we read bhagavad gita bhagavatam or any literature as far as possible we should lay emphasis on the importance of reading the sanskrit text itself okay like in our class and all in bhagavatam class in our temple we always read the verse first three times and so on but even when we read when we do our own self study of bhagavatam and any scripture we should try to make it a habit to read the text and read that word to word also because there what happens is you will see that's why you will see that many times shila propad he would give one meaning to the to a particular word in the word to word another meaning in the translation and get another explanation in the purport because that sanskrit word is so vast how could you limit it in two or three english words it actually becomes very difficult correct so 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 that's what the like mahaprabhu tells uh, 61 different meanings to the atmaram verse correct it's such a small verse if you see sadly you know it's just like like a bhagavad gita verse only that atmaram asya muniyo verse from the shrimad bhagavata but can you imagine how much has been coded into it okay so this is one the first lesson that we learn from this eighth chapter of bhagavad gita importance of specific non translatable words okay so i uh, just to see if there is any question on this before i go ahead because i thought uh okay maybe i'll 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 not take questions right now i'll just continue and later i'll take questions i think that would make more sense at least i'll cover some more things okay now let's go to another point here let let's go to another point yeah so this is connected now okay so this is how so so we are now going to understand or discuss this particular theme or topic of the coherence between shruti and smriti you know so i'll i'll just tell you why we are going to this because till now we have been talking about specific words in our scripture correct specific words in our scripture and the meaning to those words so this story is a puranic story which will tell us the importance of um, knowing the correct meaning and also the dangers of not knowing the correct meaning because when you don't know the correct meaning you may tend to take a wrong meaning out of those words and uh, we may actually end up uh, offending unknowingly the vedic scripture okay which is which is not to be done by anybody okay so let's go to this amazing story of uh, king nahusha so we all know the story in brief so i'll uh, make the uh, i'll explain the first part first so this king nahusha is a king uh, in this world and uh, at some point of time indra has lost his position due to certain activities that he did so nahusha has been offered the position of indra okay so that's where this whole thing becomes okay nahusha is offered the position of indra now when nahusha becomes indra what happens is uh, he actually gets puffed up he, he becomes proud and because he becomes proud he starts doing certain mistakes okay and one of the first mistakes he starts doing is misunderstanding vedic terms or uh, vedic thought processes he starts misunderstanding them for example uh, in the rajasuya yajya because as per the vedas in the rajasuya yajya the king is drawn by a cart driven by brahmana so this description is there okay that uh, the king is uh, there is a chariot in which the king is sitting and that chariot is drawn by seven or eight brahmanas so they the brahmanas substitute the position of the bull in this particular uh, system and they are going to drag that chariot forward okay so now now let's understand one thing this particular description in the shruti is to be seen and understood more symbolic uh, though sometimes it may have been done literally by by some group of brahmanas carrying a king like that for a small period of distance but more than actually doing it like that there is a symbolism over there and what is the symbolism the symbolism is that the the brahmanas are giving direction to the thought process and the the entire uh, uh, the king's marching forward right in terms of whatever he wants to do etc 
so it's, it's slightly symbolic as well okay so if somebody takes it uh, too literally and insists that always brahmins should be carrying me and uh, he makes brahmins is uh, you know like a horse carrier then he will end up doing an aparad to them so this is this is the first example of misunderstanding a vedic text so so similarly for example we say uh, there there is the statement that a guru is the sum total of all the devatas this is there a guru is the sum total of all the devatas which basically means that uh, the guru represents you know all the devatas in terms of uh, you know so 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 when one learns from the guru when one serves the guru one is supposed to get that type of benefit okay. but, but this is again little symbolic uh, neither the guru actually thinks that i have substituted the requirement of all devatas in the life of the disciple nor does the disciple think like that so the point here is that one needs to understand the right perspective of the vedic stories as well so not only the text not only the words but also these type of sentences one should so now what had happened with this nahusha was now coming back to the story this nahusha he 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 took up the chair of indra and as indra he was uh, having a good time and after some time he thought that if i am indra then this indrani the sachi you know this lady who was the wife of indra she is also called as indrani so nahusha thought that she is my property now because i am indra she is indrani so indrani belongs to indra so that's where he started so now when he started thinking like that he insisted to uh, everyone in the heavens that indrani belongs to me so i should have her sachi was aghast when she heard this she thought what is this nonsense how how i am married to that particular man he lost the post that doesn't mean that i have become uh, the property of uh, another man who is sitting on the post this is not right so she obviously did not agree to it uh, but all the devatas were thinking how to deal with this situation so now so brihaspati gave a good idea to sachi he said that you tell this fellow that he should come in a chariot in a palanquin which is lifted by the saptarishi so she sent that message so nahusha thought for some time and then he remembered this rajasuya yagya statement that all the rishis uh, the king's palanquin or chariot is driven by the brahmana so he thought it is fine if they carry my palanquin it is the same thing so this is the first mistake he called all these people to lift okay now there are two versions of the story we know one version where uh, as they are carrying agastya was shot in height and hence the palanquin was not moving properly and uh, nausha kept saying sarpa sarpa go ahead and then agastya became angry and cursed him there is one version of the story but there is another version which i want to discuss today the other version of the story in this version what happens is uh, uh, so as they are walking because agastya understands one thing that this person he is proud and for him to fall down the method for to make him fall down is he starts criticizing the vedic literature okay because when he starts criticizing the vedic literature he loses his religious merit and then slowly he will fall down so they realize that so what he did agastya as they were walking he asked nahusha please explain the sentence to me and he told a sentence look at the sentence somo gavascha prathama bhakshanam okay so this is a statement that comes in one of the shruti one of the vedic literature somo gava prathama bhakshanam those who don't really understand sanskrit properly or those who understand sanskrit half hearted if they look at the statement you know what it means it means that somo means the moon gava means the cow prathama bhakshana means when a cow is killed or slaughtered the first portion is enjoyed by soma okay so this is the meaning actually at least one meaning which you can take it out from it okay and later only everybody can enjoy in fact these are the types of meanings that the british indologists took from the vedic literature in order to construe various improper meanings and then keep saying that cow killing is there in the vedas and so on so this is how they say all this okay so now what happened was so agastya made this statement so this statement is a statement from the shruti from the vedas shruti means the four vedas rig yajur sama atharva so nahusha made this statement uh, sorry agastya made this statement and told nahusha can you explain this to me so nahusha was a vedic king so first meaning he understood was 
are how come cow can be slaughtered and the first portion given to soma so it's not possible so that's what he started thinking so nahusha said that see uh, maybe the shrutis are saying like that but the smritis don't allow this because the smriti shastra very clearly says that the cow cannot be killed so i cannot accept this statement by saying this what happened is inadvertently mistakenly he ended up criticizing the shruti okay nahusha he 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 indirectly placed less value of shruti saying that his smriti says this so that is only more important Uh, because cow cannot be killed so i cannot accept this statement so by rejecting that statement by rejecting the shruti there was a mistake done correct so he introduced a incoherence between the shruti and smriti and uh, this is this is the mistake that he started doing you know so this is how agastya started making certain statements and asking nahusha to explain knowing fully well that this fellow has become indra by whatever some yagya phala or whatever by doing certain things but he is currently puffed up and he really doesn't understand the scriptures properly so he is going to end up doing all these kind of blasphemy and when he does that his merits punya will keep coming down and then he will keep making mistakes and then he can be thrown out of the post of indra so all this was done ultimately to remove him from the post because these people understood that this fellow is not qualified not qualified as in not qualified in terms of uh, real deep values he may have done some yagyas to take over the position of indra but uh, the very fact that he wants to enjoy sachi uh, the wife of uh, you know the previous indra who was there or he want us to lift his pal and queen just because something is being said in some other context clearly indicates that this fellow is unfit so this is how agastya made him fall down from that position and then eventually you can bring in the other story also that he kicked him by saying sarpa sarpa and then he uh, finally cursed him that become a snake and then we know that nahusha becomes a snake and then in the mahabharat that whole story is there that nahusha captures bhima and then there is this whole dialogue between yudhishthir and nahusha and how nahusha is delivered from that situation and anyway, we will go to that story uh, some other time we'll discuss that mahabharat story but uh, the point which we wanted to make here is it is so important to understand the right meaning of the vedas because we cannot criticize the meanings of the vedas we cannot bring wrong meaning out you know that is why these six things were very important which i discussed shiksha chanda vyakaran nirukta kalpa jyotisha and technically traditionally you know everybody who was a scholar or who every vaishnava also they studied all this just like today is also the appearance uh, of i think appearance or disappearance of god of vishnu chakravarti thakur and uh, as i was reading something about his life i realized that for for almost a dozen years or so it is said that he studied all these things before he went to vrindavan okay so it's not so when we read vishwanath chakravarti thakur's purports of shrimad bhagavatam bhagavad gita we may feel that uh, so so certainly he had a lot of uh, he had an astounding devotion in his heart but it was not just by that power of devotion alone that all these things were happening right because even jiva goswami 12 years he learned under madhusudan vachaspati and what did he learn all these things only first thing you have to learn this before you start explaining the vedas to anybody you have to learn this because you should know how to preserve the words of the vedas safeguard the meaning of the vedas protect the performance and when we say veda we are not only talking about the four vedas but we are also talking about all the upanishads we are talking about the puranas we are talking about everything correct because everything is connected you cannot uh, just disregard one and say that so so no it's all connected and uh, unless you have that right background it would it, it actually becomes very difficult to understand so so this is why these these branches of knowledge are actually very important and and fortunately even today in india there are people who spend time studying these things right and uh, and especially in every sampradaya there should be people or uh, you know who have that aptitude with scholar ability or whatever to go into some of these things otherwise it becomes very difficult in the long term to preserve protect the understanding correctly okay so now coming back to this so so uh, another advantage of studying these things so when you study these things and you have the right 
understanding between shruti and smriti you never come up with any contradiction also just to give a simple example right we had this entire ritvik philosophy right so this ritvik philosophy if you see carefully um these people what did they say they said that uh, they they said that prabhupad had said or whatever they said prabhupad never said that but they were saying that prabhupad said that uh, uh, he is only the guru now and everybody else will permanently be a ritvik in his name now the point is suppose let us say for argument okay just an argument we are playing a devil's advocate here let's say for the sake of argument let's say some guru actually said that prabhupad never said let's say some some guru the mother x y z guru actually says this that after me there will be no guru uh, i will only be the spiritual master for everyone and uh, i will only uh, and, and everybody else will be just connected to the books and everything so if somebody says like that the first thing any true vedic follower has to understand is you have contradicted the shruti and smriti okay because the teachings the, the teachings of the sages are smriti they are heard but they are always in line with shruti so in shruti is there any such pramana of someone who can be a guru even after uh, he has departed that means eternally he is the guru like that nahi hai sir it's not there anywhere in the shruti it's not there in the smriti also but the point is here we are talking about smriti smriti in a more expanded form correct like like for example the statements of the acharyas also come kind of under smriti because uh, so so that is allowed like that right so all the acharyas whether ramanacharya madhavacharya or you know all acharyas they, that is also coming under the body of smriti but the thing is that is always in line with shruti okay so it it can never happen that uh, anybody can say anything that contradicts shruti so it cannot happen like that okay so so even if someone says that their guru said that after them there will not be any other guru then that cannot be accepted because shruti doesn't accept it shruti doesn't accept it. this is such a simple thing you know by, by the simple thing one can easily defeat the ritvi philosophy and one can also understand this for example if you see the if you see so many religions which do where the guru's role has been removed by substituting it with books like if you see in sikhism that's what they have done right they had only nine gurus and the 10th guru is the grantha so grantha of course has its own position but then what happens is when you don't have uh, this whole the person guru then there are so many challenges that come because of that and we see that also in many of these systems so for example so you will see many so for example if if you see the the sikh gurus the nine of them who wrote so many um, beautiful uh, the thing they, there are so many descriptions of ram hari krishna etc in the writings of the sikhs it is there actually but uh, some of these people unfortunately will say nowadays no it is not talking about this ram and krishna about what the hindus are saying so unfortunately it has become a separate religion only in terms of the categorization right they look at six as a separate thing and no, but no uh, their descriptions in the the guru granth sahib in the holy text it is all about the so many hymns are there about ram krishna hari so it's, it's all connected it's, it's all part of the vedic sanatan dharma only correct there, there is no question of this big but then but then because they unfortunately they don't have living spiritual masters to explain these things so many people come up with such misconceptions and uh, right they create a mess in terms of their understanding okay so i'll just see if there are any questions before i go ahead maybe anyone has any question at this point anybody wants to raise their hand or not yeah go ahead udav anand bro ha uh, hari krishna prabhu ji thank you very much Uh, prabhu ji i like this point very much that if we how to say criticize or misinterpret the scriptures then it eventually leads to fall down for example we see in the case of nausha also so my point is like uh, many times for uh, many people who are ignorant who are not aware of krishna consciousness we need to tell them something 
on the temporary basis uh, which is uh, not exactly as per the vedic scriptures for example uh, let's say drinking tea and coffee or someone is meat eater when we preach to them uh, it's very difficult to tell them don't eat meat but we tell something substandard that okay you continue this and you do this also so is this also deviating from scripture or it is aligning with the scripture this how to understand this yeah yeah actually if you see na uh, you may be a little surprised when i make this particular comment or statement here but uh, if you see carefully our script the vedic scriptures are not so much brutally against meat eating also as in they are not uh, so strongly against it right that's why there are so many examples of in our uh, if you if you read the puranas if you read the ramayana mahabharata you will see so many cases very routinely you will see uh, people who are involved in some kind of animal sacrifice and eating of meat or in so many ways it happens even even if you see intoxicants even if you see intoxicants uh, there are uh, you know uh, smritis that talk about uh where someone could take some intoxicant like even liquor etc on on certain occasions correct so if you see in the bhagavatam also i think in 11th canto in one of the verses it comes that meat eating intoxication and one more i forgot okay these things are uh, the conditioned soul craves for these things hence the vedic system gives allowances for these in some ways okay so they are not they are not so brutally against it huh? so this also we should know so it is so it, it's that's why that's why that's why sometimes you know even ordinary people or oh, that's why those who that so why i am saying this is sometimes in our understanding of krishna consciousness we may come up with a very binary understanding that means everyone following the vedic system must be vegetarian only okay no it's not like that even in krishna's dwaraka there were fishermen right weren't there fishermen in krishna's dwaraka it is it was a fishermen only who caught a fish and cut that yeah. in that only pradyum was found na the chai, the yeah. son of krishna was found in the belly of a fish so obviously yes. if there were if there was a fisher where there were people eating fish also and it, that was yeah. not happening in some timbuktu it was happening in dwaraka where krishna yeah. was the king okay yeah. in in krishna's dwaraka you see prostitutes right yeah. in the tenth canto you see that when krishna comes all the prostitutes are standing there welcoming the lord you know we, we read that in first canto chapter 10 so why i'm saying this is uh, the sanatana dharma including bhagavatam including if, if you see okay you take chaitanya charita abhin that story is there again of the fisherman right? the fisherman in whose net mahaprabhu was caught and that fisherman was not an ordinary fisherman right? he was chanting narasimha mantra so we know the story right when when so uh, mahaprabhu was in ecstasy this fisherman uh, caught uh, the body of mahaprabhu and uh, he started chanting narasimha mantra because he was initiated the fisherman by you by some guru in the narasimha mantra and that was his ishta deva so he thought that some bhoot has come here so he started chanting narasimha mantra and, and when he was chanting narasimha mantra uh, mahaprabhu was getting even more uh, agitated in transcendental ecstasy and you know behaving in certain ways correct so that's what that uh, that fisherman tells our what's his name sarup damodar na when he comes that i was chanting narasimha mantra so now so why i am giving these examples is so so many are there like that i mean you can keep reading bhagavatam only what to speak of other puranas etc nine canto you will read that shashada correct shashada was he was a king who was who had gone to do a sacrifice and vashishta was the priest and vashishta had told him to get some animals for sacrifice and this fellow got one rabbit and in the middle he started feeling hungry so before giving that rabbit this is the ninth canto story in the bhagavatam before he gave that rabbit to vashishta for the yagya he ate it up and vashishta understood that are part of the meat is already consumed we can't do the sacrifice now so that story comes in the ninth canto so why i am saying this is uh, it's not so black and white in terms of its okay so we obviously i mean i'm again not saying that we need to tell our people that hey come on you can eat start drinking coffee in escape from tomorrow you know chill so that's not the point here 
there is always an encouragement for people to come up higher standard is so very high only that is there only but but at the same time sanatana dharma itself is always giving this gray scale as we call it right gray scale it is giving people different points to be there and slowly you come it's not binary um, so so that's why even in our preaching so if we think that it is purely binary then it actually becomes like abrahamic preaching because in abrahamic system only things are very binary okay either you are a devotee of god or you are not there is nothing in the middle there is that there is absolutely nothing in the middle there is nothing like being dharmic but not a devotee of god you know so 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 that's not acceptable only in their system in our system it is there somebody may not be a great devotee of god or something but he can be a very dharmic person and he can go to heaven also he can become brahma also in our system he can become a devata in their system you cannot in our system we say na non devotee can become brahma in their system no you are not accepting jesus christ whatever you are hell only it's a very binary classification whereas here it is not binary so we need to know that hope that answers yes yes prabhu ji just one point more was coming into my mind about uh, lord shiva also in this regard because mm. if we see lord shiva also propagate this philosophy of uh, advait so yeah. but at the end we see shankara acharya became a devotee of krishna and he wrote jagannath ashtakam and he wrote his bhaj govindam song also so how this is there that in case of nausha he fell down but in case of lord shiva he became uh, strong he set an example how to remember krishna so although he preached uh, the advait philosophy so how to what, what is the difference here in both of these past times yeah yeah okay so see one thing is first of all na there is a slight difference between uh, there is a not a slight there is a major difference in advait and mayavad advait is acceptable advait philosophy is a bona fide vedic path krishna says in bhagavad gita 9.15 ekatvena prutakvena bahuda vishvato mukam you can understand me by ekatvena okay right even in the 12th chapter bhagavad gita when arjuna is asking correct that opening question krishna is saying that there are two ways right uh, but then he is saying that obviously he is he is saying that bhakti is the better path klesha dikatara stesha because that is full of uh, klesha it's a little hard path but that path is not unborn of it advaita path okay so so that is the first thing we need to know and yeah i am going wrong is, here prabhu ji yeah what is wrong is that mayavad okay, mayavad so yes mayavad, yeah mayavad mayavad so that See, the Shankara's preaching was strategic, right? It was to, it was, to, it was covered Buddhism. Na? It was to drive Buddhism out of India, and he accomplished that. So there is circumstantially yeah. something is done also, na? It was circumstantial. He had to do that to drive out Buddhism because Buddhism was there, and and he wanted to make a philosophy which is very sounding similar to Buddhism, so that people say that, "Are, हमारे पास ये है, why should we look at that Buddhist philosophy?" So Buddhism, even today, if you see, Buddhism is not there only in India. Until Ambedkar in 1955, we did some conversions of Buddhism and all, but otherwise, Buddhism is not so much in India now. Not now. In so many years, it's not there. So Shankara Chari, can you imagine? I mean, after Emperor Ashoka, we don't even know how much Buddhism was spread all over. But Shankara Chari managed to drive it out. Okay, so it was circumstantial. So circumstantially, if anything is done, now that's not that serious. Also, if you see. Hmm? circumstantial it is that like, like today morning i was talking about this example also in the class that like today santo tukaram's appearance also right so if you see this uh, auli the wife of tukaram she would chastise uh, lord vithala correct she would call him all kind of ill names and when he came sometime to take the thorn out of her feet she started throwing stones at him now if you look from a very abrahamic black and white system this is considered uh, a big sin you are throwing stone on god you will go to hell forever that's what their understanding would be but uh, krishna actually enjoyed it and because the reason is so this is the reason is important why krishna is enjoying because in the nectar of devotion rupa goswami very clearly says that krishna enjoys different rasas it is not that krishna enjoys or wants only favorable rasa like sakya dasya loving loving rasa no krishna also likes astonishment anger jealousy envy correct so so the secondary rasas if you see they are also there 
and if you see nectar of devotion we generally read only the first part na the first 19 chapters if you read all the other chapters so many stories are there where this gopi this gopa they are shouting at krishna they are blasting him left and right correct if you tell a christian or a muslim that uh, someone look at this devotee of god is firing god left and right and they was a my god what is this happening because from their perspective it's so black and white again right it's very artificial synthetic that you only have love and respect for him but aisa kabhi hota hi nahi hai even in even if somebody says na even between husband and wife that we only have loving relationship they are lying hota hai ho hi nahi sakta because in every husband and wife relationship also all the secondary rasas are there they must be there Okay, just that they don't become. That's why they're called secondary, na? They don't become. Pro, they don't become overwhelmingly prominent. But at times it will be there. The wife will fire you left and right. They, you know, you will shout at her. Oh my! This is not going to happen. Otherwise, secondary rasa can't be there. If only everything is love, 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 love. How, how can that happen? That's very, that's very stupid. Actually, it, it can never happen. It's impractical. Okay, so even with Krishna, it is like that. Krishna also likes all this. So that's why it is said that when Auli was. you know saying whatever she said vital was enjoying it you know somebody is shouting at me acha lag raha hai mere ko bhi you know like people like that to sometimes like to tease somewhere and get a shouting from that person vital was enjoying it he didn't take that very seriously the reason is avali's so called atheism was very circumstantial the wife of tukaram she was not like some hardcore atheist or something correct her he had love for her family and she was seeing that her husband is always behind this vital because of it her family is getting neglected so she had some kind of anger against vital which if you see from a human perspective is very natural okay i mean she was a normal wife married to paramahamsa so she just couldn't handle that okay so so it was very circumstantial so similarly i, I gave this example to say that shankaracharya's preaching is very circumstantial it's not uh, shankaracharya himself it's not like that that he is very deeply like that correct and not only shankaracharya you now this is again very important to understand even in present days na uh, when you see someone who is uh, wearing some bhasma etc because i come from that same similar background only from advaita background etc if you see people it's not always that they are strongly mayavadi or anything no it's you know, so we have these sometimes black and white definitions where we put people in a silo saying that ye pehne hai to matlab ye pakka maya hai bhi hai nahi it's not like that there are so many people who wear this this vipudi or you know they are do following shankaracharya because that is how in their family it is for generations so it's like a kula dharma so they just follow that not that from their heart they are thinking that i want to become krishna replace krishna and you know i am only krishna no, they are not even thinking of all that or they don't they, they, they may have a lot of devotion also to krishna right they 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 may not even be thinking so so we need to uh, understand that is that okay yes prabhu ji yes prabhu ji thank you very much yeah sorry about anyone else with any other question since we are just meeting after a long time i thought i'll proceed a bit slowly prabhu ji it is gone away for one question yeah gaurav prabhu go ahead yeah prabhu ji you so you said advait and mayavad they are not the same Uh, could you please explain again how are they different, and if they are different, then who kind of propagated idea of Mayavad if not Shankaracharya? Yeah, yeah, good, good. See, Advaita, Advaita is a bona fide Vedic path. Okay, let's be very clear about it. So, so look at twelfth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Prabhu ji. In twelfth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I mean, this is again very important. See, if you see what is Arjuna asking, "Evam satat yukta ya bhakta sam paryupasati ye cha paksharam abhyaktam." Eshaam ke yoga vittama ha. He is saying there are two ways to come to you. One is the personal worship. One is abhyakta worship. Which is superior? He is asking. So the point is both are bona fide. Okay, please try to understand. He is not asking that whether one is bona fide. He is asking which is superior to the other. He is, he, Arjuna's question is very clear. And Krishna nowhere has said that he is pure bogus path. No. Krishna said Maya vesha mano yama nitya yukta upasate shraddhya pariyobeda te yume yukta tamam mataha. He says. by focusing on me you can come to me and then look at third and fourth verse he says yetak yetak sharama nirdesham abhyaktam paryupasate sarvatra gama chintyam cha kutastam achalam druvam sanyam yendriya gramam sarvatra sama buddheha te prapnuvanti maam eva sarva bhuta hite ratah krishna is describing the impersonal path in verse 3 and 4 of 12 chapter 
okay in fact you know this is one very interesting thing sila proper in that translation if you have if you have bhagavad gita with you you can just observe that third and fourth verse translation proper says these people at last achieve me uh, i don't know whether you remember this particular phrase in this particular translation proper says at last achieve me but if you look at the sanskrit na that at last is not there krishna is actually not saying at last so then why did proper say that he said that understanding the whole spirit of the 12th chapter where it is very clear that the bhakti path is the easier path and this path is a little more difficult path okay klesho dikatara stesham krishna says in the fifth verse that it is a very difficult path advaita path okay so so that is why prabhupada uses that word at last they come to me but my point was at least in this third and fourth verse krishna is not saying at last and all krishna is saying they come to me that's it okay they achieve me that that's what krishna is saying so why we are saying this particular point is that advaita path is a bona fide path okay it, it may be a difficult path it will be indirect path whatever it may not take you to the highest level of goloka vrindavan it will put you somewhere in brahma jyoti or whatever it is okay so 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 all that is there okay but, but this is to be understood so this is bona fide what is not bona fide is a mayavad mayavad basically is something different mayavad is, is going one step beyond advaita where it is attributing krishna's form to be maya where in mayavad we they basically say that krishna took a form out of the mode of goodness or krishna's form is maya that's a mayavad na mayavad means what they are attributing the illusory energy to the form of god okay and by doing that so so they have got one step ahead they have not just said so advaita path that is not talking so much about krishna the lord's form in fact advaita path doesn't even bother about it it's like don't care humko farak nahi padta ho hai nahi kya hai humko bas advaita path follow karna hai so they do they don't they don't go into that domain only okay but mayavad is like that so why it is like that so you have to understand why shankaracharya had to do that because in buddhism there is no deity only correct in buddhistic philosophy see see now in the uh, vedic advaita philosophy deities are accepted na lord shiva krishna all these deities are accepted but in buddhism there is no deity only so the concept of deity only doesn't exist so when shankaracharya started preaching prachannam bhaudyam uchyate he started speaking a philosophy which is very similar to buddhism where in this also no d de- either no deity is there or if at all a deity is there that deity is also maya only basically that means he is also like us or he is a product of the modes etc so that's where it started okay so because he wanted to preach that and that's very clear why shankaracharya did it okay so so that's where mayavad comes up okay now i i so this point is also important that the there 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 may be some people who may be this hardcore mayavad etc but my point is that there are many people who are you know advaita vadis only or there are many people who may culturally have this whole thing about they may be as i told you they wear because i come from that family where you know we people would wear this viputi on our forehead okay <laughs> till the tilak came up obi at least so i know so many people in my family and so many people in general who are you know who do this just as a family tradition and but, but then again they, are, they 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 study understand shrimad bhagavatam and, and they go ahead in their understanding it's not that and and actually mayavad philosophy one thing good is is very difficult to understand it's it's too technical if you see only some books of shankaracharya like advaita chudamani and you know all that there is one i forgot sharirika bhakya and one chudamani book is there so these two books uh, elaborate that philosophy which fortunately or whatever are so difficult and so technical that most common people will not even read it or even they read it, they, they, they really don't get there you know to understand that also is very difficult so so that's a saving grace so to speak is that okay garo so buji not again not, not exactly Uh, see a duet the way i understand is it means everything is one okay so basically i will also become god that is what it would no, no, be see, again, right see, no no one second one second see the, 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 that is where the point is that's where i started from this whole statement i will become god is not there only that way the other way philosophy is you will become in one with brahman and brahman is not god see that's why i started in my class also i said that the the problem is term terminology 
when we translate i, I made that point in the beginning of the class yeah. you remember that brahman yeah, is not is... equivalent to god so when we say that i have become god in english it has a completely different meaning okay but the sanskrit understanding is you merge in the brahma jyoti that's a perfect so but so that is we are saying advait is merging with the brahma jyoti is advait okay and then maya will what means what uh, that even yeah. the lord's form is a, is a maya yeah so so in, in, yeah that's exactly the point so in mayavad they attribute all the deities whether it is lord krishna rama everything this is one part of mayavad philosophy i was much more deeper honestly i have also uh, you know not read these books like uh, sharirika bhasha etc but one thing they do because of which they are called mayavad is they attribute the lord's form to be made of the three modes of material nature which so, is not so, which is not accepted in the shruti and smriti see that's the point the shruti and smriti don't accept this theory that the lord's form is made of the three modes of nature ye nahi hai kahin par shankaracharya managed to explain because of his whatever you know proficiency in sanskrit and scholarship he managed to give such a meaning from the vedanta but this is not supported by shruti and smriti Is that okay? mm. So, 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 Prabhu, sorry, two, three more questions. So, who propagated Mayavad? If not Shankaracharya, who propagated? Shankaracharya only. Shankaracharya only propagated. I never said that he did not. He only propagated because he, he was he, that. That is Buddhism is Mayavad. Buddhism is very much Mayavad. Mayavad okay. isn't is the same thing like Mayavad. Basically, that's what they say, right? I mean, effectively, they say the same thing. That's why this is called covered Buddhism. The same thing. Shankaracharya okay. only so, propagated it, but at the same time, Shankaracharya spoke about personalism as well, at least in his personal way. And yeah, so so that is very clear. Shankaracharya only propagated it. There is no second question so, about it. So, Prabhuji, if Advait and again, I also agree that even I had this thing in my mind when I read Gita that so many times there are hints of that Advait kind of thing, and not necessarily always Advait. But yeah. at the same time, the four sampradays that we have, none of them propagate Advait. right and we yeah, the, the, the yeah, yeah. stand is that they are all authorized so uh, shankaracharya doesn't fall into that category of sampraday right so yeah. how do we understand uh, this uh, kind of you know no no one second when you say four sampraday na we are saying four vaishnav sampraday how will they propagate advait vaishnav matlab they are behind personal form only no of god they want to serve krishna in personal form four sampradayas are four vaishnava sampraday padma puran talks about four vaishnava sampradayas that doesn't mean advaita parampara did not exist please remember advaita parampara existed prior to adi shankara and even the smarta brahmin community of india na it is not yes. that they are all connected to shankaracharya as in so formally because see hinduism is again not so centralized control na so so there are people there are brahminical cultures that connect to the technical advaita philosophy which is which is there this is ages i mean which is vedic path you can't deny that is there in shruti smriti that is there in bhagavad gita of all the books that is there in shrimad bhagavatam in so many places if you see you know shukadev goswami is read the what is that 12th chapter of that uh, the 10th chapter of the 12th canto of shrimad bhagavatam shukadev goswami is final instructions to parikshit maharaj Just read that chapter. You will feel as if he is giving an Advaita lecture only. He is indeed giving. I mean, just read that. I mean, I, I don't have that immediately. Maybe I'll if I take that book out, I can read those verses. If you read those verses, the oh my God, it's complete Advaita because Advaita is a path. It's there. That has never so been Prabhu, rejected. So Prabhu ji, but then that Vaishnava, leads to Vaishnavas. Vaishnavas want personal form. For some part, the goal is not Advait. That we are very clear about. So that is that is good to know because see, we also heard about. I mean, I also heard about Nath Sampraday, and uh, like uh, so many of uh, yeah, I think some Yaneshwar was born was part of Nath Sampraday. Yes, right? yes, right, yes, and he, and that is not that's not one of four Sampradays, and he was the one who was like, taken as the devotee of Vittal, right? Yeah, yeah. So so, so yeah, so these people are proper Advait values. Uh, They are not Mayavadis, I say. So Shankara carried it. No, you can't call Yaneshwar and others technically like that. No, there is no evidence of that. Can't right? even Tukaram for that matter. No, Tukaram was clearly Vaishnava in his other uh, thing. 
he he may have not belong to sampradaya see now there is sampradayik vaishnavata and there is even outside sampradaya people can be vaishnavas right so he was not at least mm. formally part of the four sampradayas no he was in santa tukara uh, but he is accepted as a vaishnava only by everyone so, by across the board there is no question about his not being a vaishnava okay so so to so the last question last question i have is let's see once we see this advait is also bona fide is vedic correction is there right and then uh, what what we call as demigods and we had this discussion maybe a year back also about lord shiva and lord, lord krishna devata devata that devata yeah so <laughs> devata right that, that they are that they are actually shiva and uh, vishnu are same in one way and if i if i just put a philosophical point over here that even within, within vishnu forms there are so many different forms like ram krishna tirupati whatever we call it guru you there so many different different forms of the lord so one can argue that lord appears in whichever form the devotees imagine him to be so just like within vishnu form there are different different forms similarly shiva brahma ganesh saraswati whatever they also different forms of the lord and which actually will lead to the advait kind of thing that everything is one ultimately there is one god and it can appear in different different forms and that's the reason you can worship anybody as long as you worship from your heart and soul it is the same thing is it not a valid kind of argument yeah see now uh, to some extent uh, bhagavad gita or the vedic scriptures in in general do talk about it as in where the various devatas are like i'll tell you the verse only 9.15 krishna says na ekatvena prathakvena bahuda vishvato mukam he says right others worship me as singular uh, prataktvena in many forms or as universal form so krishna has included worshiping bahuda that means in varied forms as approaching him only he said that you read 9.15 bhagavad gita so it is there but there are still some differences na there are differences so with these other deities it is transactional so so we know other things also na that it is transactional the relationship with them that means you don't develop love pure i mean as in that you know what we call as uh, love that gen- the develop of love is is primarily with vishnu tattva only na it is not so much with like with ganesh and others it becomes transactional because these 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 are powerful devatas but uh, they are again they are not the same person always sitting there the same person is not always ganesh na the different different people are coming there it's a post which is there okay so so they are respected they have the amsha of the lord as in you know they are as powerful as him in some ways and uh, if you are sincerely approaching them many times they take you to the supreme lord also devatas do that devatas are not Correct. selfish people who are thinking that hey mere paas aaya to main usko bhagwan ke paas nahi it's not they are not like some uh, like uh, like in the indian system you may have some mamta banerjee or someone who will say that you come to me i'll not take you to modi or send you so whatever i mean sorry for that example but right they are not like that that's not how the division is here they are all devotees only so they will take but the point is right so so in some sense that part is correct at least from advait perspective but again if you see from uh, from another way yes right you want to develop the loving relationship that happens primarily with vishnu only na no? you don't have uh, the that... how can we see that if somebody is somebody like say lord ganesh and yeah. he may have a very loving relationship with him why yeah. is it that it has to be only with vishnu uh, even no. lord shiva somebody can have i mean there are there have been great devotees for lord shiva also right so no, i'll tell you i'll tell you that it is only with i'll tell you i'll tell you how to understand it see two ways so first thing first thing is so if you remember i had quoted this also sanatan goswami is or some one other is this statement is there where they say that when someone approaches the devata suppose someone approaches the devata very sincerely you know with love mm, mm, uh, mm. eventually they will be led to vishnu only okay example for that is markandeya you observe the example of markandeya in bhagavatam we see markandeya is a devotee of krishna correct there are other puranas which clearly say that in his youth younger age he was a great devotee lover of lord shiva okay he was a lover of lord shiva that is what markandeya was okay and eventually he came to krishna he will come so even if suppose you're right if somebody has that type of love and very unalloyed feeling the approach of devata absolutely no problem i'll tell you 
they the devatas are representing krishna okay they may the, that person may not have had a complete understanding that part is agreed right he has not had yes. a complete example of the truth but because he is approaching the devata in an unalloyed form it is just a matter of time that he is going to because see, ultimately spiritual life is a journey na so why do we have to be so paranoid that oh he is now with ganesh with shiva with someone no it's not like that he is on the path he is developing that love will very easily very quickly you know by the mercy of that devata by the mercy of that paramatma in the heart of devata uh ripen up and he will come up that's fine as said we have no objection to that truly thing i personally i mean i'm not here uh, saying from a uh, from a institutional standpoint but if you see the gita perspective it's fine it's it's like krishna is not going to punish that person in fact he is seeing that op- he is worshiping that person as krishna only right are why talk about that why talk about that if you see our acharyas have even been so magnanimous they have said that even these other people who are there outside sanatan dharma when they look at see the religion of christianity islam may have its faults but people in those religions are also sincere na there can be sincere followers correct, in that correct. path system galat rahega system mein hazar fault rahega system is wrong because they talk all things like Unless you have accepted this particular prophet, this particular thing, you will permanently go to hell. This is absolute nonsense that they talk. Correct? System is wrong, but sincere fellow can be there who looks at a Jesus or someone with that feeling that with that feeling of love he approaches like that. Is he not going to get uplifted? Of course, he is going to get uplifted. There is absolutely no question about it. Then why so, speak so of Devata? Yeah. So, so the is, thing is, is, so sometimes why we may okay. Sorry to interrupt. sometimes why we may do this is because we may want people to quickly so to speak you know come to the uh, what shall i say that uh, uh, you know the, the the level of pure bhakti where you are uh, as in where, where you have a complete understanding of shruti smriti okay because when once you have that then uh, once you have that then you cannot avoid only the understanding of krishna that's unavoidable so prabhu ji i think i'm uh, i'm very glad to at least hear this because i had this thing i mean personally i felt the same way but it was like always kind of not possible to discuss this in a setup of institution that we had so nice to hear that but now again the thing is that when we say that it, the person the devta eventually take it to vishnu now where is the shastric reference to that because why i'm saying is markande is one example but there could be examples other way also i do not have something of no no no, no, no there are there are so many there are so many examples if you see na no, like for example no, lord shiva this is just complete it is yeah. complete so for example for example <clears throat> now none of us probably have read it in detail but if we probably read shiv puran there are instances of wherein it talks about how lord shiva is greater compared to lord vishnu there must be also examples of all these devotees in reference to all this uh, twelve jyotirlings who were actually great devotees of lord lord shiva and they, there is no evidence of them becoming lord vishnu's devotee later on so there will be many devotees like this who people who go to kashi i mean lot of those are actually shiva devotees and they die in that yeah. manner so how yeah. do we say that that eventually they have to become lord vishnu's devotee and devta will take him over there that may look like that we are vaishnav so we are thinking that way and it is not no, necessarily no. shastrik no 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 so see two three things first of all as far as lord shiva is concerned there are so many statements about him where he very clearly says for example about kashi he says that anybody who departs in that holy there is this puranic statement only and not bhagavatam it is one of the other puranas where he says that anybody who departs in the holy city of kashi i chant the name of lord rama in their ears who says lord shiva says this to parvati okay so so this understanding is there in general now now so so now now coming to the other point that you said you know see this knowledge also that we are talking now it is a very comprehensive knowledge that we are talking now you cannot expect that in every purana everything is given how will that happen see the the shiva purana has a purpose it is limited to attracting certain kind of followers with tamo guna correct they want to drink mm-hmm. bhang they want to eat this that they want to give such some offerings to shiva and take that agar usme sab kuch bata diya to unko progress karne ke liye path hi nahi hai na so it's like you cannot expect that you know so like i mean we give this example always right in the fifth standard mathematics book every math cannot be just dumped into it 
So a Shiva Puran will not talk about it. Are how can you disturb the face of that De- Devata worshiper? How can you disturb it so much? But see, this knowledge also that I told you, this is not this is not to be told to everybody. It's not that you go to Ujjain or some place and you see Shiva worshiper and say, "Acha karo, ah, Shiva ka bhakti, aoge Vishnu ke pas." Are come on, you are undermining that guy. You are completely demotivating him. You are making him feel as if he is a bum over there, just sitting and you know doing something where he is supposed to come to your place, or you are feeling that you are too superior to him. So see. because see we are talking from see now now when you connect all the purana so then you will have to read the shada sandarbha of jiva goswami so jiva goswami shada sandarbha he will take all the puranas link thing together and then prove how krishna krishna to bhagavan so is correct okay so this is a very comprehensive understanding but that, but but the vedas are very patient with everyone let's let me tell you they are in no hurry When we say na, wo aayenge, aayenge, matlab, bare, millions of lifetimes ke baad aayenge. In fact, let me tell you, there is Shiva Loka, right? The Shiva Loka is considered, Shiva Loka means uh, not Kailas, which is outside the material world, but uh, you know, correct? There is one uh, Kailas, na? The eternal Kailas. Yes. There, there are yogis who are sitting there almost eternally. They are happy there. Uh, are they not more advanced than us? Of course they are. Much, much more advanced. If they want, can't they go to Vaikun? They can. They don't want to. They are happy with Shiva there. And Lord Shiva also, I mean, no, nobody. And Krishna is also not feeling impatient. क्या यार इतने लोग अभी भी बैठे कैलाश में जल्दी प्रोग्रेस करके आना चाहिए मेरे पास कोई आए नहीं रहे इसपे. So see, one thing about Sanatana Dharma, now it is very patient with everyone. अरे people, people have their own thought processes. They will take their time. They will. See now, this is applicable only to Shiva, mind you, not to the other devatas. See, because the problem is the other devatas are all temporary, na. मतलब उनका life है ना अभी ब्रह्मा is also 330 million whatever billion 40 million years. उनका life हो गया है ना. You cannot eternally stay with Brahma as a devotee. वो Brahma ही change हो जाएगा 330 million years के बाद. अलग व्यक्ति आ जाएगा वहाँ पर. So that bhakti, you can have that bhakti. That bhakti, even if you have to Ganesh or some other deity. that bhakti is a representation it is a what shall i say it is a it is some kind of a reflection of what you could have for the supreme and because you are doing it purely to this devata and this devata is also a pure devotee only ultimately you are going to slowly go ahead but the point is you cannot have an eternal relationship with ganesh or something because that ganesh only is not eternal na? i mean that's very clear from the shruti incident but with lord shiva you can sit And it is a fact that in Kailas there are yogis sitting eternally. Eternally, मतलब we don't know how long more they will sit. And obviously, it is an eternal kingdom, na? It's not that one day Kailas will become empty and Shiva will be alone, thinking, "Chala, acha ho gaya." Sab log chale gaye wahi put. Abhi main bhi chala jata hu, kam karta hu, band karke, chala lagay ke na? It's not like that. Are you getting the point? So the Vedas are very patient with everybody. So so that so 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 every text will not say everything. If it says that, then you have, don't have any motivation only, na? No? Then it is like killing your motivation. If if there is a text which is talking, let us say about Durga, and there also you bring this point, eh? Krishna only is supreme. Ultimately, you worship this. You have to come. You have to give up all this meat, meat, other things that you are interested, na? No? You have to give up all other aspirations. Your ana padega tumko. Then that fellow is like you are telling him, "Are you a second class citizen, man?" I said, "Is it a lega fellow? Oh, his motivation is not there. How can he do his work?" Yeah, actually, one thing in support of what you are saying is actually that even that I agree with the point that if you are trying glorifying one particular devata, then is then is not correct to bring in even the supreme yeah. person over there. Yeah, <laughs> one can argue that okay, just like Shiva Puran is there, also Vishnu Puran is there, but then we also have got Bhagavad Puran, and Bhagavad Puran is actually not Vishnu Puran, so it is actually talking about the Bhagavan. And there, I think that we can quote that this is about Bhagavan, and that is where what is mentioned over there is actually the the final thing. Is no, 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 so that's why, right, Prabhu ji, that's why I told you to understand the comprehensive connection of Puranas. Na, this Shada Sandarbha of Jiva Goswami is important. This Tattva Sandarbha, Bhagavat Sandarbha, you know, that's like a oh my God, it's like a rigorous analysis of Puranic text. Can we? Are we? Okay, can we read that book, or is it that we are not qualified to read? No, hey, books? what is this? Not qualified, qualified, not qualified. Everybody is qualified. Why did Jiva Goswami write? Nobody is qualified to read. Of course, one can. I mean, <laughs> could be requiring a certain level of understanding to 
and if yes then can we how can we get that book do we have it in no no tatva sandarbha so one of it i have read only one honestly is gopi pran man prabhu translated tatva sandarbha so i have read that and that's quite it it takes it, it like it takes four five readings of it to start understanding what he's saying so it's little difficult but there's nothing that i mean i, I don't want to say that uh, you know only some people are qualified no it's nothing like that it's there it's, it's all these books are written for everyone but why did they write it other Okay, I mean, at least people who are, you know, we are familiar with Prabhupada's philosophy, read Prabhupada's books and all a couple of times or more or whatever. So we know what is what, right? So you can read and understand. Okay. Thank you, Prabhuji. All right, Krishna. Okay, I think I'll just end. Uh, Nitin, I'll take your question next time. Maybe we will surely read next. Like small, small one, two sentence points. That uh, uh, if those who are following the Ad- Ad- Advaita Vad, so whether they will be also getting the perfection. one part is this and second point is that you are telling about the sabda of the chanting of the hari krishna hari ram kind of thing in the beginning of the lecture so as the ascent of some devotees some chant hari some chant rama some some chant ram so is it okay with them or See, generally is... generally one should try to chant correctly the pronunciation is important okay the bhava is there and if you are unable to chant then krishna and krishna has that right and mercy and everything to chalo bhul jao is se nahi hoga you know to take it but that doesn't mean that you don't try only to chant properly we should try to pronounce na the names hare krishna hare krishna matlab try to karna chahiye humko barabar okay bro abhi kisi ko hua hai nahi abhi somebody is a chinese or you know some some background where some word or letter only is not there unke tongue jo nikalta hi nahi क्या करे भाई जो आता है बोलो बस भगवान मर्सी को ले, ले लेंगे आपको ओके लाइक दैट या एंड एज फार एज द अद्वैतवादी इज द कंसर्न दे हैव सो मेनी डेस्टिनेशंस लाइक इवन फॉर एग्जांपल द शिवा वर्शिपर्स आर कंसीडर्ड अद्वैतवादी ओनली राइट बाय एंड लार्ज दे आर कंसीडर्ड अद्वैतवादी ओनली सो सो ओके सो सो दैट इज ऑल कंसीडर्ड इन परफेक्शन ओनली या ओके आई थिंक वी विल एंड टुडे वी आर टाइम्ड आउट वी विल मीट नेक्स्ट टाइम हरे कृष्ण शिला प्रभुपाद की जय गौर भक्त वृद्धि की जय निधा गौरव प्रमाण दे हरे हरि बोल